we've always had health testing, hips, elbows, eyes, heart, etc. And we had JLPP that is still fairly new. Would you agree with that? It is. It is only about eight years in the United States right now. Okay, so eight, eight years in the JLPP, um, give or take, right? Right. Hey, this is Deborah Owens, Texas Rottweiler Ranch. Come on, let's go look at some of my dogs. Rottweiler Vlogs, episode 140. Mizzle and Mac out here at the Texas Rottweiler Ranch with Miss Deborah Owens. It feels good to be back, y'all. I appreciate all the texts and phone calls. I've been out of commission for a little bit over a week and a half or so dealing with the shingles, but I'm back and I definitely want to bring this episode to you as soon as possible because it's a much anticipated episode. So be sure to give the video a thumbs up and if you haven't already subscribed, it really helps me out and it helps the video out pop you a bag of popcorn and enjoy the content hello everyone i'm deborah owens um i own and operate the texas rottweiler ranch and um have been doing this for many years when i was about 17 my husband had came home and told me that he had seen this dog that was massive and that he had just fallen in love with it um, we were in germany and the actual uh, police uh, had the dog walking it down the road. And of course he did move to the opposite side of the road. Um, so he told me he wasn't leaving Germany without one. And we located a breeder in our area and we went and that is actually when I fell in love with the Rottweiler. Those dogs were just so beautiful and massive. Uh, we ended up taking home a puppy and we named him Saber. And Saber was with us for 11 years and he is the one that got me hooked on Rott Rottweilers. When me and my husband got married, we already knew that he was gonna be stationed in Germany for three years. And so I was good with it and um, didn't know I was gonna find my calling when I went there with the Rottweilers. But um, my husband was in the military and I just came over as a military wife and we had two children there and uh, that's where our journey with the Rottweilers began. I mean, to say that I'm impressed is kind of like an understatement because it's like you fell in love with the breed at the motherland. Yes. <laughs> you know, like they, the breed originated in Germany. Right. Um, you know, you see the was, how was it seeing the dog in Germany? Like what, were there Rottweilers everywhere? Is it like, Actually, no. Mm. Um, back then it was about 1987 when we got our first one and there what they weren't everywhere in fact you know we had to ask around to even find out what kind of dog it was because we had never seen a rottweiler before and um there were a few local places but we did travel a little ways to a breeder that was recommended to my husband and um he had quite a few rottweilers uh, on his property and like i said it was just amazing it was just amazing to see them all there, when you see a bunch of them all in one place, is just kind of amazing. When you'd walk around, um, the older people, like mostly the older men that know the breed in Germany, they would always want to give you advice. So I always would listen. If they knew how to speak English, they would always give you an earful. And so I learned a lot. And I, whenever um, they would tell me things, I took that to heart. And those are things that I have followed through with you know, throughout my whole breeding career, um, especially on the number one thing that almost every older person that wanted to give me advice about the dogs were, don't let them run and jump as a small puppy. It's kind of hard to keep them from running, but you know, the jumping is um, very important not to let them do. And so when they told me not to let them jump, 
I took that to heart and I followed that through all the way to every puppy that I've ever sold. Um, it was pretty amazing uh, having him there and everyone wants to you know, talk to you about your dog and where you got him. I was always very proud of Saber and Saber was a very smart dog, probably one of the smartest dogs that we've ever owned. Got him as a puppy. Um, he was just a big, a big ham from the beginning. He loved the kids. He loved every child that ever, you know, came into his environment. Um, he, he wasn't really like, like, a working dog, per se, because um, he was an indoor dog that played with the kids, and that was most of his exercise was just running and playing with the kids. Nice. So. Ultimately, you end up shipping him here to the States. Yes, we flew back on a military flight and so of course Sabre flew, flew for free. Um, he did not like being put in the crate and um, he didn't like the flight very well, but he, he did fine. And so when we got back um, to Texas with him, of course everyone, he was better looking than most dogs that you can find back then in, in Texas. And so everyone wanted, you know, a puppy from him if we ever bred him you know everywhere we went he got you know compliments and how great he looked when we got back you know we just loved saber and he just grew and the bigger he got the more compliments we got on him and uh, he just pretty much stayed the same personality just fun loving loved the kids loved everyone and so on my 21st birthday we'd been back for a bit and my husband bought me a female uh, we named her Baby, and uh, she was a pretty good dog, and like he took his time to find a good one. And so he told me that he bought me Baby because he thought that I should breed them because of the love that I had for Saber was so strong. He felt that that would be a good, you know, opportunity for me to basically have babies um, and be able to, you know, a lot of people had wanted a puppy from him and. It was just it was just a good opportunity, mm -hmm. and so then uh, about a year later he bought me my second uh, female, and then so I had the three dogs, and I started um, breeding them once the dogs turned two. Also, uh, the the pedigree uh, for Saber, uh, we just did it the same way we do now, um, and we registered it into the AKC. And so the two females that I got were AKC, and then that's how we got started. So, um, was the name always Texas Rottweiler Ranch? Actually, yes. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about that. Um, I bred those three dogs for you know many years until the females got too old to breed, and then I um, stopped for a little while, and then I just had my dogs until all three of those dogs passed, and so. I loved each and every one of them till the ages of 10 or 11. And then I had a few years, about three or four, where I didn't have any. And I um, had a couple of children in that time. I already had Kim and Becky, and then I had Angela and Justin. And so I took a little time just to raise the kids and, you know, be a mom. And then we started um, again purchasing Rottweilers. And at that point, we decided to um, buy a little bit more expensive dog. And so, so when you say expensive dog, because I think that, you know, as breeders and to a certain extent, some Rottweiler enthusiasts, I know you see the meme, you get what you pay for. Yes. You know, uh, your dog's too expensive. The $500 you absolutely up, you know. get what you pay for. Yeah. And so, uh, the two females that I had originally started with, they were good dogs and my husband did, um, you know, pay a pretty good price for them, but we wanted to, um, you know get a little bit better quality and so that's what we started doing and we uh, then came up with a name Texas Rottweiler Ranch and so that was probably mid 90s and from the mid 90s until now we have just totally improved the first litter uh, my husband actually built me a whelping box and it was actually in our living room at the time uh, with all the children there but um uh, Kim and Becky and then uh, nieces and nephews were all around but we had the puppies uh, I actually remember how many there were she had nine and so um, the puppies were like amazing and it's like 
it's kind of like nowadays, like if I go a few weeks without having puppies, then I start getting all depressed that I need babies. But whenever the two of them had their babies and there were nine puppies, at first, you know, you have the mom and she has the nine little suckling puppies, you know, it's all great and fine. But then at about three or four weeks, you've got nine puppies running around your house. And so with uh, nine puppies and two kids, it was, it was rather hard. It, to say the least, it was imagine. hard. I can imagine. Um, whenever they, when she started to give birth, you know, I hadn't had very much experience at all. I was still, you know, just an early twenties. Um, it was, it was strange, but it just kind of came natural. It wasn't like it was scary or anything like that. It, it just basically came natural, and and every she did such a great job as a mom. She basically didn't need much help or anything like that. It just, it was just like a blessing. Uh, we had a ton of people that already wanted a puppy uh, from Saber because like I said, at that time in Texas, you didn't find a dog that looked as good as Saber. I mean, he was original, uh, had that big head, had the size and things that they just weren't producing in Texas at the time. And so all the puppies were actually sold before we ever even had the puppies born. Uh, they all pretty much went to police officers around the Waco area and friends of ours in the Lorena and Eddy area. People would um, call and they would also send pictures. Um, back then I got pictures actually in the mail, something that we don't even hardly do anymore. People would just send me pictures of their kids playing with uh, the puppies and we actually ended up having between the two dogs that I had um, at the time that I got baby and then he bought me the second dog. Uh, we actually probably produced about six litters. And so I would, I would get uh, cards with pictures in it of them, uh, the dogs playing with their children and things like that. It was, it was something that I still get today from puppies that I sell now, way more now than back then. But it was just awesome getting to hear from the people and seeing how the dogs grew. And, um, Whenever I didn't have puppies for a while, I would see somebody that I might have sold a dog to having a litter and I'd be like, ooh, I want to buy a puppy. But I knew that I needed to take a break. After your break, what was the first dog that you purchased getting back into it? Actually, um, I purchased my daughter's uh, dog. Um, she was graduated from high school, so we uh, bought her a dog and she named it Tay, which means big. Um, and while we were there, uh, we had this little puppy that kept following me around and I kept pushing him away and I would take him and put him back on their porch and I would try to run to the gate, but he would come down and, and be at my feet before I could get back out of the gate. And we actually ended up buying him because my daughter told me, my daughter Angela said that the dog had picked me. And um, so we named, we brought him home and we named him Cyrus and uh, he lived with us for 12 years and he was one amazing dog and uh, Cyrus was one of a kind. Very, very unusually smart dog. He could open gates, open doors. Um, from the moment we brought him home, never used the bathroom in the house. He was just super intelligent but the thing is, is he would herd the children. If the kids went too close to the road, he would literally nudge them back into the yard. And he was a good babysitter. He took care of the kids. Um, he kept them in the yard. And I knew that when he was in the yard, nobody was gonna touch those kids. And aggressive in no means, but I knew that if it came to that point, he wouldn't let anyone take those kids out of the yard. Right, did you uh, breathe, Cyrus? Um, I actually did, but not very, not very much. Um, we bought Cyrus with the intention of breeding him because, you know, I was I was looking around for dogs at the time and that's how we found Tay for Angela. Um, and I didn't intend to, to buy him, uh, but we bought him and we brought him home and we did breed him about probably four times, but I had a hard time um, getting his AKC papers. And so we bred him and we sold those puppies pet only at the time and we never could get the paper so we stopped breeding him. It started to be where you would open up the paper and every dog um, ad in there was for Rottweiler puppies. 
Uh, the sad thing was is there was a lot of people mixing them with other dogs and things like that. And uh, it, it, was, it was way overpopulation at that point in Texas anyways. And just, they were everywhere and they were breeding them with everything. I think that if I would have stayed with um, probably the, the kinds of dogs that I had been previously uh, selling, not of course my dog I brought from Germany, but the other two, if I would have stayed with that type of Rottweiler, meaning, you know, not, they didn't have the big head, uh, they weren't very big, you know, that type of thing. If I would have stayed breeding those, I probably would have, would have just failed, you know, terribly. But what we had decided to do is invest a little more money and um, actually start buying from different breeders that had a good breeding program and look for that bigger head and the better bone structure. And I think that that's the only thing that kept me afloat. Um, so you made a conscious decision. So like, and for, for viewers watching this, like really listen to what she's saying because you're basically saying you invested back into your program with yes. dogs that had better pedigree and yes. had those distinct qualities that we immediately look for in a Rottweiler because you know the Rottweiler's head is his crown jewel. Yes. And yes. We, we all know that, right? So you recognize that there was a difference with you was producing earlier versus what you could be producing and you sought out. So who was some of the breeders that you went to early on to start transitioning? There was a couple in Missouri um, that, had a, that had a pretty good breeding program, but their dogs were just just beautiful if you've ever been to my web page uh, the actual web uh, site uh, for texas rottweiler ranch on the banner with the american flag that dog came from a breeder in missouri uh, at the time uh, they didn't really have a kennel name um, they had a farm and that's basically what they did was breed rottweilers and that's where i got three of my you know dogs and then the the dog that you actually see on the banner is greta uh, Greta never produced one puppy. Um, the reason is, is whenever I had her hips x-rayed, she ended up having hip dysplasia. So needless to say, I, they only had one male and they refused to um, get their dogs checked. So I moved on to a different breeder, but um, had the other two dogs that I bought from them x-rayed and they were fine and we continued on with the breeding program and I moved on to a kennel in Nebraska called Giant Rots. I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard of them and we did business with them for many years. Um, their program uh, was focused on size where my program has always been focused on temperament and size. Uh, if you have a big dog you can't do anything with and it's not good with your children, to me, it's just not good. If somebody, you know, one person can ruin you, you know, and it may be how they even raise their own dog, but all I can do as a breeder is focus on breeding the best dogs that I can possibly breed, dogs that I would want around my grandkids, dogs that I'm not scared for them to be around my grandkids, that's what I want for other people. So that's what we focused in way back in, in the day. Anybody that's ever bought a dog from me throughout the years will tell you um, that I've actually shot some people down about, you know, that's just not what we do because they want the biggest, you know, dog with the biggest head that they could possibly get. And I've actually told people I'm not the breeder for you because temperament's way more important to me than the size of the dog. Uh, which I do love a big dog. Um, if the dog is, is a giant, but is not good with your children, I mean, you know, like, it's just not safe and it's just not good. It's a liability at that point. Absolutely. Yeah. Is this the point that you started to do more research about pedigree? Absolutely. Um, pedigrees, like, the temperament of the dog is what I really had been focusing on throughout the years. And then, um, actually, um, the owner at Giant Rots actually told me, you know, I needed to get more into the pedigrees and she was explaining, you know, how it works and everything. And I learned a lot from her, um, on pedigrees. And then, um, 
much. I fell in love with some of the, the dogs in Serbia through by just watching their videos and, and seeing them uh, in the pedigrees and then watching their videos online. Um, I knew I had to have some of those some of those dogs. So your, was she your first mentor? Yes, she was. And we were very good friends for a very long time. So how important is mentorship in this, in, in your opinion? Like, It's very important. You have to have that person or people that you can go to to ask questions. It may be something simple. Um, nowadays, um, I find myself going to Wayman Reeves and um, Sean Brentley for my questions that I have. And uh, I would have to say, out of all of the people that I've talked to, Sean has probably taught me the most on things that, you know, are simple things that you just don't think of. And um, I can give you a, a story. Uh, I was talking to Sean and uh, we were discussing um, ultrasounds and things like that uh, last year. And whenever we were talking about it, uh, I said, sorry, it's taken me so long to answer. I'm bottle feeding these puppies. And um, he said, why are you bottle feeding those puppies? And I said, well, the mom just doesn't have enough milk. And then that's when he told me, you need to get the, the dog on this supplement and this supplement. And you know, within a week, no more bottle feeding. She had so much milk. I, I had messaged him and told him that the milk is actually just dripping out, you know? And uh, he says, well, you know, anytime that you're having an issue, just let me know. And you need mentors. You have to have them to have a successful program because there's things that you may not have ever experienced. And there are also things that you just might not think of that they are just going to tell you right away and it's going to make your life a lot better. I find myself watching uh, people that are just getting started and uh, there's one guy named Tim on my Facebook. Uh, you probably know him. Um, when he first got started, he was asking questions on uh, Facebook and I just messaged him privately and said, hey, you know, I've been doing this a long time. If you ever need anything, you know, ask. And also, you know, Sean Wayman, um, Cornelius, you know, they're there if you need them. And they, I, I believe that he's in Alabama, but um, he said that he had already uh, spoken to them before. So that was good. And you know, you, you've got to have those people that you can reach out to because it may be something simple. It may be something that they've already experienced. Dogs from overseas used to have a dog tail. Now they have tails. Right. So you lived through that and you went through that. Talk to me about that transition and then you ultimately starting to import dogs again. Yes, well, I'm kind of fond of both, to tell you the truth. Uh, my very first dog, born in Germany, he had a tail. I uh, brought him back, got the two females, they had dog tails. So, that's like one of the very first questions that people ask me whenever they are inquiring about a puppy. Uh, do you dock tails? And actually, yes and no. Um, a as it, like, throughout the years, like, everyone was docking tails. And I think that I just kind of followed the program of what everyone else was doing. And recently, I've decided that I don't want every litter docked. Um, I like a dog, the, the Rottweiler with a tail. Um, so lately I've been not doing half and half, but doing to where I can kind of show people that are interested in maybe having a puppy with a tail, what they actually look like. And um, whenever people ask me, I would import a dog from overseas. It would have its tail. They're like, why does your dog have a tail? And honestly, a lot of people think that they're born without one, but actually guys, Rottweilers have a tail. Um, yeah, that's that's a big misconception. <laughs> well, yes. What do you? How do you decide which puppies to dock the tail on and which ones not to? Because you know the, you have to dock a tail very early on. And yes. It's hard to see anything. They all look the same. Yes. And that is one of the little controversies that I have with a lot of people. And um, and this is why. So say I'm going to leave the tails on a litter, and somebody wants a puppy from that litter, but they want their puppy's tail docked 
It's hard for them to understand that the puppy has to be docked within the first three days of life. Basically on the third day is perfect. And so if they are on a litter, say the Lilu Dagger litter, and then they want um, their tail to be docked, but they might be third pick female. You know, it's not fair for you to get to pick your puppy at day two and your third pick and first and second pick may want that puppy. So it's kind of hard to explain to people and um, so what I've been doing lately is just saying if you want a litter with a docked tail you have to pick from this litter mm -hmm. because I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be unfair with my customers that's one thing that I never you know I'm never unfair I'm an open book um, and so I have to say if you want a, a, a puppy with a tail this is gonna have to be the litter that you pick from who was the first one that you imported after Saber? That would be Lilu. Um, whenever I seen, I actually seen Lilu um, advertised um, on a group that I actually run, um, Only Rottweilers on Facebook, and I just fell in love with Lilu. Um, I had talked to my husband about it and told him that I want to start doing more imports, maybe a few a year. Uh, that way, you know, I, I just feel like it was something that my breeding program needed to just spice it up a bit. And so we bought Lilu. And Lilu came to us and she was just this little fluffy ball of fur. And she has actually turned into one of the best dogs that I've ever had. I did at the time go with a breeder that wasn't known. Um, and actually, uh, Sean Brentley followed my suit and bought Lorena his dog from the same breeder um, and I have to say that it wasn't a mistake uh, going with this breeder she loves her dogs uh, she really puts all of her time and, and effort uh, into the dogs and showing them and caring for them and uh, I went back to her a couple more times and have actually purchased four more dogs from the same breeder I was told by several people, you know, be careful. You know, everybody always, you know, tells you be careful. You know, you don't know this person. It's the person's not well known. But I just looked at the love that she had. I watched a lot of videos that she had and the love she had for her dogs was just amazing. And I just felt that it was the right thing to do to, to get Lilu and in doing so, um, you've seen one of the biggest females you've ever seen, that same mm -hmm. breeder, uh, Dania, I came from her. And then I've got that blessing Dagger. I mean, Dagger is one of a kind. Mm -hmm. And she came from him, uh, Dagger came from her. And so um, sometimes you just have to go out there on you a gotta, limb. You gotta take a chance. Yeah. In, important is taking a chance. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, in, even when the, the breeders are known, we're gonna we're gonna get to that in a second. But even when the breeders are known, you still rolling the dice. Yes. So um, when you you imported, was the process well? The process was different this time around because you had to get a broker. Yes. You had to go through that whole process. You didn't have to do that with Saber. No. So how was that going through that the first time? It was scary, you know, because you don't want to make a mistake. It is a lot of money. Uh, whenever you are sending money basically, you know, sight unseen to somebody that you don't know, um, thousands of dollars at a time. Um, the breeder actually made it very easy. Uh, she doesn't speak one word of English other than hello, but uh, we had a good translating program on my phone so we could speak to each other. Um, and then she found a broker um, there in the Ukraine that actually did speak uh, great English. And then what she couldn't tell me, he did tell me. And um, it basically, it, I was kind of nervous at the beginning, but at the end, they made it they made it very easy. And that's why I went back uh, four more times, you know, to the same breeder. The broker was very, very knowledgeable. Um, he was very good, didn't try to scam me out of any extra money. I mean, it was just all straight across the board, um, up front, and, and he was very honest. So it was just a smooth transaction. You had a good experience out there. Very together. smooth, very, very smooth That's with good. her. And that makes all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. The group, like I wanted a group for a really long time that I could say is my group, but 
Um, I didn't actually venture out there and get it. And then when I did, the thing grew so quickly, it was actually kind of overwhelming because my Texas Rottweiler Ranch page is totally different. My group actually has like over 28,000 people in it. And when you've got 28,000 people like commenting and posting pictures and sharing, it, it kind of gets overwhelming after a while, but it's about four or five years old. We've always had health testing, hips, elbows, eyes, heart, etc. And we had JLPP that is still fairly new. Would you agree with that? It is. It is only about eight years in the United States right now. Okay, so eight, eight years in the JLPP, um, give or take, right? Right. But it seemed like there was a time that it was just all over the place online, right? Yes. Everybody was JLPB, 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 yes. right? What was it going through that time? Because I think it's kind of died down a lot. Yes. Um, I think more people are aware of it now. But if, I guess what I'm trying to say is, if we're aware of it now, that doesn't mean that it wasn't there back then, correct? Right, right. So um, would, back then, did you see anything even close to JLPP? Did you? No. Okay, so let's talk about that a little bit. Okay. JLPP is something that I know a lot about because I did a ton of research. Um, I can tell you how my story with JLPP happened. Um, I heard about it. Uh, somebody invited me, um, an AKC um, judge actually invited me to his group and it was called JLPP. Hadn't had a clue of what it was. So I started reading the articles, started reading everything that everyone was posting about it and it's scary. It really scared me. And um, at the time I started testing my dogs and I went through two or three at a time and I tested every dog that I had. Um, whenever I got Dagger, I tested him as a puppy and Dagger's test came back carrier. So to me, it was like, I literally put the paper down on the table because I didn't know everything I needed to know at the time about it. I hadn't done all the research yet. And I literally put the paper down on the table and started crying. And um, I was having a really good cry, and I messaged Sean Brentley. I told him, I'm freaking out, I'm freaking out, Dagger's test came back positive. And he told me straight off, take a deep breath, it ain't that bad, let me explain some stuff to you. And of course, like I said, you have to have those mentors, that's where the mentor comes in again. And so Sean calmed me down, explained to me some things that I hadn't read in this group about JLPP and he told me, you know, do more research, keep reading. Um, we're learning more about it every day. Now this was several years ago. Uh, Dagger is three, so, you know, it was about two and a half years ago or so. And uh, so after I talked to Sean, I then went and told my husband, it ain't that bad, you know. Um, it, he, he told me, don't worry about it and I can still breed Dagger. Well, I still didn't I didn't feel real great about breeding him and I actually called the OFA and through um, one person to the next person to the next person they kept transferring me and I ended up with the actual um, doctor that found JLPP in the Rottweiler and I actually had a really long like I felt bad because I was taking up his time but I basically had about an hour long conversation with him and he asked me the dog that you're talking about, this dagger, what do you like about him? And I said, he's just an all around great dog. He said, does he look like an exceptional Rottweiler? Yes, sir, he does. Um, is he good with kids? Does he have a good temperament? You know, how's his coloring? How's his eyes? Um, and I just kept saying, everything's great. He's like almost the perfect dog. He said, then breed him. And so at that point, I was like, well, I don't want to pass this on. He said, as long as you are being mindful of your breeding program, you're testing every female that you have that you may want to breed with him, 
you can breed that dog that has JLPP. Don't take a specimen that is as good as Dagger, don't take him out of the breeding, breeding program just because he carries a gene. Um, you're the boss of that gene. You do not breed him with another carrier. You will never have a problem. And so I then made all of my uh, records on my JLPP um, open and I put all of their certificates on my page so that anyone that may be buying a dog that may want to breed that dog in the future can see that Dagger is a carrier of the gene. And then I always tell them when they pick up the puppy, if they ever have any questions, they can always come to me um, and, and you know ask any questions they may have about it because I, I, I know a lot about JLTP now. Nice. And I think that you, you explained yourself, you articulated yourself very well because there are a lot of misconceptions out about it. Um, you know, thank God that I um, was taught about JLPP by some good people who told me early on, you just yes. can't breed carrier to carrier. Right. right. Um, and um, I think that what ultimately made me curious or made me or gave me cause to pause was back in Germany or back in these other countries where they had these dogs even back in the, the, the uh, early 90s, they were breeding carrier to carrier. Yes hand over fist, it was, yes. it was happening, right? Yes. And we didn't see anything. Right, because it wasn't here and it wasn't known. So, um, do you think that it started coming here because we started importing more dogs? Absolutely. Okay, talk to me a little bit about that. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I have to say that, like, in my kennel, um, Gil was one of the last dogs that I actually had tested. And I bred Gil a lot throughout the years. Um, when I when I first heard about JLPP, um, I was told that it had only been in America about five years. Well, Gil was six years old, so I didn't even bother having him tested at first. But then um, I bred Gil to a female that I wanted to keep a puppy from, so I wanted to go ahead and and, um, and test Gil because I wanted to keep a puppy that he had sired. Um, and then turns out Gil did have um, JLPP and so I did put it out there and let everyone know that had purchased puppies from him so they don't make a mistake and breed one of his puppies to maybe a possible carrier. Um, about that time I noticed that all my friends that were importing dogs they were all coming up with carriers almost you know about the same time that I noticed that Dagger was a carrier, um, that's about the time that everyone that was importing dogs from overseas, uh, Serbia, Germany, not necessarily the Ukraine, I, I ended up uh, finding that you know, for myself with Dagger from the Ukraine, but Serbia and Germany, everyone was have, that had a big kennel was saying that they were having a dog that was a carrier. And so I believe that you know, just as many dogs as we're all bringing over, we just really bombarded the United States with JLPP because of the dogs that we have imported in now. It's funny that we're on this thing, and I'm, I'm about to, I'm about to drop a Rottweiler exclusive here, y'all, because I've, I've never said this on camera, but I know a lot of people, and I've heard a lot of different things. You're very knowledgeable, and I want to know if you've heard the same thing I've heard. I've heard that. Some time ago, there was a, a lighter female in Germany that was bred to a black Russian terrier. And the offsprings of these puppies, which you know the, the black Russian terrier is the carrier of JLPP. The offsprings of these puppies that look like the Rottweilers were kept and produced. And they had darker markings, etc. And this is kind of what started it and sped over into the other countries and ultimately come into the States. Did you hear the same thing? Absolutely. Um, I heard the exact same thing. Um, it was from the Black Russian Terrier bred to a Rottweiler is what I've heard. And uh, it's sad. It just really is because now uh, something that a, a Rottweiler never had before, you know, less than 10 years ago, it was unheard of in the Rottweiler. 
And now this is something that every Rottweiler breeder and Rottweiler parent have to deal with. So, now, we know that people have taken the Rottweiler breed and mixed it with other breeds to make their own stuff. And yes. one thing that, you know, I've said this on multiple videos of my own, the number one thing of a breeder is to put the breed first. Would that be a prime example in your opinion of not putting the breed first? Absolutely, absolutely. I, just my personal opinion, you don't mess up the breed that way. Um, to me, it was wrong. Um, you just don't mix two breeds together. I, people ask me sometimes why I feel that way. I've had people say, would you breed? I've actually had people say, would you breed my dog with one of your studs? And of course the answer is always no. And then they want to know why. And it's just because it's just, to me, wrong. Uh, it, I'm here to better the breed. And to me, that wasn't bettering anything. It has basically ruined and caused a lot of deaths in the Rottweilers. I agree, and it's, a, it's definitely a sensitive subject. And um, I, I agree. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Thank you for saying that. You're welcome. You've been through a lot, you learned a lot, and you, you have a, a lot of beautiful dogs, and um, you have a lot of respect in the Rottweiler community. Um, throughout the world, not just in the States and not just here in Texas. Um, talk to me about the current state of your, your breeding program now and everything that you have going on and then talk to me about the move to your new location because you, you have a beautiful piece of property here Thank and you. you're doing amazing things. So talk to me a little bit about that. Okay, well right now, um, I have to say that, and I am biased because I'm their mother, but I probably have some of the best looking males that I've ever seen on the face of this earth as far as the Rottweilers are concerned. Burning, I named Burning after the legend Burning. Um, he's basically no kin, but just his, his way as a puppy reminded me and so I needed to pick a B name and so I, I picked Burning. Mm -hmm. And the, he's the one that you're going to start showing AKC. Yes. Okay. He is. I've got a new. I've got a new. Um, a new trainer. I have to give him a shout out, King Burns. Um, he is from Austin, and he has uh, been coming and training my dogs. And the Texas Rottweiler Ranch is going to go in a little bit different direction than we've ever been before. Um, we're going to start stepping into the show ring a little bit and see how that goes for us. Um, Burning will be first. Uh, Burning's sister's name is Barris. She is one of the smartest dogs in the kennel. And uh, then I have Chaos and Coronis. Um, these dogs are just amazing. They are absolutely amazing. And then when you throw Dagger in there, um, I just don't think it gets much better than that. But we are going to continue to strive. Uh, to be better, um, I see big things. Nice. So we're, we're at a new location, and part of that is investing back into your kennel as well. Talk to me about that process, and um, ultimately, you know, uh, what's the plans for this property as far as expansion is concerned? Okay. Huge move to move here. Um, we started looking for properties um, many years, maybe four or five before we actually took that plunge to move. Uh, one is because if you have 20 dogs um, and you're, you have a kennel and everything's nice and calm, you really don't want to have to have all that drama. But we knew that we needed a better place. Um, we knew that we needed a, a, a place with less trees and more open area for them to run. And when we found this place, um, me and my husband were actually walking the property and said, this is it. This, this, is, this is where we need to be. And so we bought the property. We were the first ones that looked at it. And I actually, um, we actually bought it right at that moment and said that, you know, we want it. This is it. And so the house was never shown to anyone else. 
Um, we started the process of moving um, our things here, but we couldn't move the dogs. So for the first month, me and my son took turns um, staying in Eddie at the, the old Texas Rottweiler Ranch uh, while each of us uh, took turns coming to unpack and start to get used to the new place. Um, we had a very nice construction uh, crew here, uh, Bernie Boyd Construction out of Maple, and he started building the kennel um, actually about 20 days before we actually moved in. And so about at day 15 or 20 being here, we got to bring our first dogs over. And of course, Dagger uh, and Lilu came first. And then as kennels were built, uh, we can, we, I would stay in Eddie and they would tell me, okay, you can bring two dogs today. And it was just a slow process, but it was the way, I didn't want the dogs on the dirt and not knowing what had been here in the past i don't like my dogs just run around in the dirt i know that sounds crazy a lot of people said that silly but i wanted them to be on a concreted area till we were here for a while um so we got the kennels built it was about forty thousand dollars to get the new uh kennel up and going um the only thing that we really have left right now on that kennel is to get the water lines ran down there right now I just have a hose pulled down to the kennel um, my next project is fencing and um, we're gonna fence in that whole um, area to where they can be let out and they can run and have their own time to just do whatever they want outside of the kennel and start rotating them like that and then the next project after the fencing is going to be a birthing house uh, that is a um, complete indoor um, area that will also have outdoor runs um, and the reasoning for that is right now um, in my house uh, we have a bar and the bar is actually right now the birthing room so we want to get the the puppies out of the bar and into their own area and I know as everyone has um, heard the weather this past um, winter we had the worst freeze that texas had ever had and it was a um, huge challenge uh, to try to keep my dogs warm we had kennels in the house with some of the pregnant dogs inside and then we had the we had so many heaters down there and we had 16 heat lamps going and we managed to make it through um, I did do some posts because like my customers were concerned that we wasn't keeping it warm enough because we had never seen a winter like this before but then after they seen the pictures of the dogs and seen that you know their water never even froze inside the kennel that you know we pulled through and everything was great but I do want an indoor kennel built in the next couple of years so we never have that problem ever again. The best way to get in touch with me is just through my phone number, give me a text. <clears throat> um, I don't do much talking on the phone because I'm very, very busy. But you can text me um, anytime and I always answer my texts. It may be 11 o'clock at night, but I will get you answered if you send me a text. Um, my number is 254-640-9948. Um, also, um, up and coming um, we have a lot of litter sticks and hit the ground um, how it's working right now is I take the deposit of $500 and then um, that puts you on a waiting list and just because your net your name pops up at the top of the list doesn't mean you have to go with that puppy uh, you can pass and your name stays at the top I try to encourage people just because you want a puppy um, don't go with it just because that may not be the litter that you want a puppy from just hang tight you stay at the top so that you can get a puppy from the litter um the mom or dad or litter that you the, of your choosing basically um and we've got a, a website um i've had my regular website about 15 years and it's a texas rottweiler ranch also and uh, you can always email me through that, but it's a little bit slower getting those emails uh, read just because I am so busy. Um, and I will tell you now, some people get a little aggravated because I'm not real fast at answering emails, but my dogs come first. And so I try to spend at least two, sometimes five, six hours a day with just my dogs. And so sometimes your emails don't get answered for a few days. And I apologize, but my dogs come first.
tonight. Well, I appreciate you being on Rottweiler Vlogs. I'm happy that we were finally able to make this happen. This is Rottweiler Vlogs 140, and this is your episode. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I appreciate you. Thank you, Mom. Hey, this is Deborah, Texas Rottweiler Ranch, and I'm going to walk you through our day-to-day -day operations here. Um, first thing I do when I wake up, I walk out every morning just to make sure everything's good and everybody's doing okay. And about 11 o'clock in the afternoon, I will come out and sometimes with my son, sometimes usually by myself, and we will spray the kennel down and then rinse it out. Um, we will check off feeders. Uh, all of my dogs free feed, they all have but one uh, 50 pounds of dog food per kennel. Uh, we keep those topped off once a week. All the nice fresh water that they want. Some of them get bigger buckets because they like to actually get in them. So they have a water bucket and then they have a play bucket. Um, and so it takes approximately two to three hours each day if you're only cleaning the inside and you are actually um, doing nothing but watering and cleaning. Now when you add the food to it, it's about a four hour day. So at least once a week, we do four hours uh, a day just to make sure all feeders are topped off and everything's good. Dagger 
Sometimes I have to top them off twice a week, but it's very uh, unusual. And, and I'll tell you why. When you have a dog that gets fed twice a day, those dogs are going to eat more. When you have a dog that can eat whenever it wants, it's going to eat less. And um, some people will argue with me about that, but it's the truth. If you have a dog that's, that is um, available to food 24-7, that dog is going to be less food aggressive also, and it's going to eat less. On a setup like this, the only thing that I would recommend is something that I will be doing this year. We are going to have garage doors installed all the way across both sides. Um, I like the open concept because I, I never like the way a dog acts whenever it's completely in a closed-in building, even whenever it has a run, you know. Um, I like them to be able to see out. I like them to be able to hear things, see everybody, and the air to flow through. Um, the only thing that I would suggest that if you're going to do a, a, a building like this, I would put garage doors on it so you can have the freedom of opening them up. If it gets cold, you can shut it down. So I would definitely, that's what we're going to do this year, and I would definitely suggest the garage doors being applied.